So I'm very excited to be here and talk about my journey in automating malware development in red team engagements. And in the next 45 minutes, I will talk to you about um, how my journey into the realm of um, malware development and red teaming began. I will talk also about an introduction into malware development for red teamers in general, and then in the end talk about how an approach could look like to automate malware development uh, for your red team operations. Um, so a few words about me, who am I? Um, my name is Can de Marmels. I am a security tester at RedGuard, and I am doing penetration testing and red teaming. Um, in the last year, I delved into malware development, and um, this talk will also be from the perspective of a pen tester slash red teamer who is um, interested in uh, malware development. Um, First, um, what is the goal of this talk? Um, I will show uh, my journey and also the lessons I learned throughout this journey. Then I will present my approach on how automation in the realm of malware development could look like. Um, not in scope is to discuss implementation details of specific malware techniques, and I will also not present uh, novel malware techniques here. Before we start, um, just a little side note about ethics. I think it's very important that we in the red team realm and malware development realm um, think about the consequences of what we do and what we develop. And it's always important to keep in mind that um, also red teamers are defenders. Um, it is therefore very important to keep in mind that our job as a red teamer is to secure our clients and not um, other way around, yeah. Um, so it is imp also important to see a bit how uh, such a journey st uh, starts, and here I will um, show a bit um, my journey into this realm. My first step were very overwhelming. Um, there are a lot of different topics which are also huge, um, like Active Directory, also reporting, which is quite difficult in the beginning. And there is a vast amount of different topics that are coming um, to you at first. Um, but I um, started by um, taking a course and learning all of the stuff. And as soon as I felt ready for the engagement, I just started um, with my first payload. And I think most um, also have had the same experience that when you um, do your first try, um, it might get detected. Um, the reality is that lab and course techniques might not work in the real life. Um, the reality is also that there are a lot of security controls um, applied. Um, and the initial challenge in red teaming is already how are we getting an initial command and control channel up and running. Um, default payloads are all well signatured and uh, public loaders are often also very much signatured and sometimes it's very hard in the beginning to see um, when something was detected and when and why. So the question now remains, what are we going to do now? And the answer is that we need to first gain a better understanding of the defenses. And so I think uh, most of the audience already know how a normal antivirus is working. We have um, features like uh, static signature detection, heuristic detection and behavior be uh, detection and uh, much more. Um, the reason I point this out is because I want to show a bit the differences um, on how an EDR is working. I think also most of you already heard the terms that an EDR is just an antivirus on steroids. Um, I really don't like such explanations because they don't explain anything and you just think that you under have understood something that um, was not really explained at all. So. Um, if you look at a high-level perspective on an EDR, um, the, the architecture is quite simple. You have um, your monitored endpoints with some agents installed. There is uh, a backend connected that is also connected to the EDR cloud, and you might have other systems like a security incident and event management solution that the telemetry is sent to. 
If we have a bit of closer look on how the agent is built, um, an EDR is trying to collect um, telemetry from various sources, such as the file system, also the network communication, processes, and so on. To collect all this telemetry, an EDR has various sensors. Um, it might be worth mentioning that the um, kernel mode driver is like the heart of such an EDR, um, which is collecting various telemetry. And based upon uh, the telemetry that is collected, an EDR builds the detections to then alert them in, in the last. The reason why I am telling you that is just that we get the right view on, on such an EDR system um, because it's uh, similar to, to a radar which we are seeing here that is constantly searching for anomalies um, in, in these telemetry sources that are gained. EDRs are a very complex system and also it differs on many um, things like the environment, the product, the configuration, and also the point in time you're testing it. Um, yeah, this was, was just a small introduction into how you should look like at an EDR. There are um, various more stuff to know about it. Um, but we want to get started um, with malware development and starting also to, to see why do we even need to know about malware development in red team operations. So the initial question is, um, why do we need um, malware development? Usually uh, most companies are using existing command and control frameworks because developing an own command and control framework um, is really expensive and maintaining even more expensive. Um, some of you have might seen the, the last talk from Dobbin about developing such, an idea, uh, such a command and control framework, which is really much effort which you need to put in. So the question is, why do we need to um, have malware development? Um, and the answer is that you are um, needing it to uh, start customizing uh, command and control framework and um, also develop custom loaders and custom initial access payloads. Um, if we speak about loaders, um, some of you might ask what a loader is. Um, we need first to see what shellcode is. Shellcode is generally binary machine code, which is position independent, uh, mostly developed in assembly or position independent C. And it's also an output format that generally a command and control framework is supporting. And now the loader is the piece of software that is loading and executing um, this shellcode, um, possibly in a way that is not detected by defenses. Um, you have many options on how to build such a loader. There are various projects um, online for loaders. You can use an existing one. However, here um, they are often in proof of concept quality and also um, often signatured as they are open source. You can also write a custom loader. This on the other side can be complex and time consuming and also know how is needed in malware development. It's also possible to have like a, a bit of combination to choose known techniques and make a, a known implementation of it, which might be a bit an easier approach in the beginning. Um, I uh, took a question from an expert, from Bob, the loader builder, on how we can build such a, a modern malware loader. Um, and here I want to present a step-by-step -step approach on how we can build um, one of these loaders. And for that, um, the, the idea is to present 12 steps where we can pick and choose um, the options to build then a custom uh, shellcode loader out from the chosen options that we have here. This approach is not really new. I took the approach um, from Inceptor and just in, uh, adjusted some steps um, to further automate it, um, which we are going to see later. Um, the first step is that we need to choose a, an appropriate output format. This can be an XE or a DLL with an export function or even uh, triggers in events, for example. It can also be um, other formats like a Windows service or there are other exotic formats like CPL or XLL, which are like special cases uh, from a DLL. 
In the next step, we need to choose a location where the shellcode resides. And this um, can be um, either locally inside the binary, um, for example, inside a section of a PE file, um, like the sections that we um, see here, for example, or, or, or it could be also remote, uh, meaning in this context outside of the binary. Um, this could be, for example, a web server, um, a file path, or even in the registry, for example. Um, you can be very creative. There are a lot of other options uh, where you can put your shell code uh, to. In the next step, we are looking a bit closer to the shell code where we have two options to manipulate it. We have shell code independent manipulation techniques, um, which is essentially um, a technique that the loader does not need to take care of about, so the loader is not required to do anything with it. The most popular example is Shikata Ganai, um, which is still going strong, and um, for example, Sliver is still using nowadays uh, per default. Um, as already mentioned, these are quite easy to implement as the loader only needs um, to uh, make sure that the right memory permissions are set um, when executing. On the other hand, we have um, loader-dependent shellcode manipulation techniques. Um, these, on the other hand, are techniques that require the loader to do something. So techniques like AES, XOR, or also zipping, for example, or jigsaw, which is a um, recent blog post. Um, here, um, the shell code needs priorly be uh, manipulated with the according technique, and the loader then needs to undo this operation before he can execute this. But we have a problem here. If we apply, um, for example, AES, um, we are getting a big blob of entropy, which is always uh, very suspicious from a, uh, from a perspective um, of an EDR or antivirus. And for that um, reason, the next step is to include shellcode obfuscation. So we take the manipulated shellcode and hide it um, somewhere, somehow. Um, the obfuscation is really only there to, to hide uh, the big blob of entropy which we might um, have. Um, you can be also here very creative with um, your approach. The loader just needs to have the undo operation before being able to execute it. Um, just um, some examples could be IPfuscation as we see here on the slides or MacFuscation as an example. Um, just as a note, uh, the technique displayed here is um, well known because some threat actors already used it and will be uh, most likely detected by anything. We have now seen various techniques on how we can do manipulation and hide our shell code, but at some point we need to execute it. And here we also have two possibilities. We can either um, execute it locally, meaning inside the loader's process, um, simple example uh, are create thread or uh, just a simple function pointer. Um, remote injection techniques on the other side are much more complex. Um, remote meaning in this context outside of the loader's process. Um, the most popular examples are process injection, APC injection, um, which um, I think most of you um, already know. If we abstract it a bit a layer um, up, we have the following steps that are needed. We first need to choose a target process, and therefore we need a way to either enumerate um, processes or to um, start a sacrificial process, with, which would also be a solution. In the next step, we want to make the memory where the shell code resides available to the remote process. There are um, various um, uh, techniques uh, for doing that. The most popular one is virtual alloc X, for example. In the next step, we then need to bring the remote process to execute the shell code in some means. Um, also here, like the hello world example to see. The no here to note is that remote injections are much more difficult in terms of evading detections. I'm really looking forward for the talk of Raphael tomorrow. Um, if you want to dig in deeper into um, modern remote injection techniques, I think this could be very interesting for you. 
We now um, have chosen our execution technique, but um, we also want to choose some evasion techniques uh, to evade detections. These can affect any parts of your loader and also basically can be um, anything. They can be difficult to implement and also easy. Um, some uh, difficult uh, examples are you seeing here. Um, there are also easy like file bloating, which are sometimes surprisingly successful um, if you use them. On the other hand, you can also choose anti-analysis techniques to implement, which could be, for example, debug detection, sandbox detection, and so on. The ninth step is that we also can choose customization options. Uh, for example, the metadata like the icon or the name to make it look like Chrome or something. Um, we can add other customization options. A um, popular one is a right to left overwrite attack to spoof um, file types, for example. Um, an optional step afterwards is that we can apply code obfuscation, for example, with obfuscator LLVM or something else. Then um, we need at some point to compile um, our, our code. Um, this can be with various compilers. Here just to mention that the um, compiler flags might also play an, uh, an interesting role um, where you can choose for various options. As a last optional step, you can also think about signing your binary. Um, you can either self-sign it or if you um, were able to compromise some code signing certificate in an operation, you can use that, for example. Um, Okay, we have now seen 12 steps, um, how we can pick and choose um, our options to build a loader, but we have not built the loader yet. So the question is, how do we implement now the loader that we have chosen from all the options we have seen now? And the reality is that um, there is no easy way to learn malware development. You really have to dig in to this rabbit hole if you want to learn it. Um, and get your hands dirty um, in doing it. You cannot just spend an afternoon in malware development. It's a whole own uh, career field um, with a lot of things to learn in it. Um, I won't go through this whole list. There are various skills needed. Um, Rat has a very cool talk um, if you want to have an introduction in what you need and how you can get started in this realm. Okay, I am finally ready again. Um, I have made um, more research. I have um, started uh, with malware development and gained much more experience. And I am ready for my second try. And um, also here, the real world hits me again. And um, I just uh, had problems that there are even more security controls. How do I get the loader executed and even on the system? Um, this is something that our loader did not care about it yet. And here um, we are going um, into the world of initial access payloads. Um, so the thing a user initially clicks on, a popular example is the OneNote bat uh, loader exe example. Um, if we look at it from a higher perspective, um, such an initial access payload chain could, um, may include the following stuff. You have a delivery payload, uh, for example, uh, HTML smuggling or a calendar invite. There is often a container to bundle your infection dependencies like ISO or ZIP. There is a trigger, a way to start the payload chain, um, could be a link or click once application. And then the actual payload or even more intermediate steps um, that are doing something to trigger the final payloads then. Um, and often there is also a decoy to continue the pretext narration from your phishing campaign. Like, for example, displaying a PDF invoice or something else. Okay, um, if you're new to that, and if you heard that to the first time, you already see that there are various steps needed to really get your um, final payload that you need to deploy um, in your Red Team operations. And there is also the point where automation comes into play um, to help um, building um, these infection chains and also um, the loader that we see with all the various techniques. 
Um, so the questions why do we need automation is quite simple. There are many repetitive steps. For example, with the whole shellcode manipulation and obfuscation, um, if you create a new shellcode, you need to do, redo that steps always again if you do it manually. Um, you need to obfuscate it and so on. You also may want to change single step in steps inside um, of this whole chain or inside um, these techniques. Um, which makes you uh, doing the whole process over and over again. Furthermore, your loaders should be stable. You do not want to get into the situations where you ask yourself if your payload was detected or if it was just a bug inside uh, your loader that made it crash. Um, what should be automated? Um, the 12 steps that I introduced earlier. Um, so this is the goal um, of what we are automating. Um, there are many open source projects available. Um, for example, Inceptor or Pisor are um, two loader frameworks that are very interesting for the initial access payload. The only interesting one I saw was ACE. Um, the alternatives would be to directly modify your C2 or also commercial solutions that may exist. Um, the problem I realized um, with these open source solutions is that they are often signatured quite well for good reasons. Um, and they also tend to you be um, quite hard to use and install at some, some point. And they also have often many options, making them potentially a bit unstable or hard to use at least. And so uh, my idea was then I want to build my own framework. Um, the vision of it was that the framework should provide customizable and evasive loaders and initial access payloads and also to um, provide a variety of um, options to choose from um, to build your loader and also to build the initial access chain, uh, chain payloads to create a modern chain. Um, my idea was to add uh, own variants of known techniques, so these are not novel malware techniques, but um, slightly um, variations of uh, already public techniques um, to pick and choose your final loader then. Um, I also implemented that. This is uh, my Darth Vader tool, which I um, started to implement there. Initially, it was just a learning uh, project to learn malware de development in my free time. Um, it turned, however, uh, to be quite a useful tool, which I was also able to use it successfully in engagements. The um, features are that I can generate compiled implants or also the source code to then further um, develop a more advanced loader, for example. And in my opinion, the value lies in the approach of the tooling, and this is also where the talk of uh, the main goal of this talk is about, and not in the actual techniques it has implemented. Um, because, as already mentioned, it are re-implementations of known techniques, and the, the approach is to pick and choose um, from the options. It's also a really um, speed up for custom loader development. So if you're developing uh, some advanced loaders, you can already start with um, some uh, manipulation techniques already implemented, for example. The question is now, OK, nice, you have built that. But um, why is the framework not open source? And the answer is, as I already mentioned a bit, um, as soon as it is open source, it's less valuable because it gets signatured quite um, fast. And um, this is also good. So I don't think that it's a bad thing to have these signatures. However, as a red teamer, we also have the job um, to simulate adversaries who have the capability um, to develop um, custom loaders and custom malware. And therefore, it is very important to also have the capabilities of unsignatured payloads um, to use in our red team engagements. And also already mentioned, the benefit um, would not be that big as the implemented techniques are not uh, new um, and are publicly known generally. OK, if we um, look a bit under the hoodie of the tool which I developed, um, I used Python as a framework because it allows rapid development um, very easily. 
um, click as a command line framework because it's also very crucial to have a stable and nice interface um, for a command line um, to use it. Um, the heart of my tool is that I used in this approach a template engine, in this case Ginger, um, to generate the actual implant code which is developed in C. C is, in my opinion, still a very uh, good choice if you want to do malware development, um, but there are also other possibilities um, to use. Last but not least, testing is very important, as mentioned, um, for which I use PyTest. The tool runs on Mac, on Linux, and also on Windows. It uses on Mac and Linux the MinGV compiler environment, and on Windows MSVC to support both of them. Um, since nobody likes to install compiler environments, I built a Linux and also a Windows com um, container where all this stuff is bundled and this gets um, also built by the GitLab CI, which is also executing the tests and does a bunch of more things which we talk about later in the talk. Now we went, want to look at the framework itself and understand how it works internally. The code engine um, generally has the following five step. Um, it creates an internal configuration object from the command line um, arguments which you pass to it. It then um, pass this um, object to the code engine with, which initiates then the shell code manipulation and then um, starts to initiate the source code generation and in the last step then um, Oops, this was a bit of a fast last step, then initiates the compilation of the source code. Um, the main approach, as already mentioned, is to use a template engine. I think most all people know what a template engine is. You can throw a bunch of data to a template um, that then can be rendered to a final document. This approach is often used to generate HTML, for example, in um, server-side rendering. However, you can also use the same approach to generate arbitrary source code, um, which I used in my approach. An alternative would have been to use um, compiler instructions, um, but for the following reasons, I chose to, to go with the approach of a template engine. Um, for me, it allowed to create a cleaner source code. I can also call Python functions for more complex tasks inside the templates. I can have more complex conditions. Um, it allows me to organize also the templates very modularly and um, can quickly change also logic code in implant templates without changing the UX. Um, it also allows to implement new techniques very fast. Um, a colleague, for example, sent me the new jigsaw technique, which is a relatively simple technique, and it was implemented in about 30 minutes, um, and it works with every um, option that is already present in the framework. So it really, it, it really um, pays out if you have a good um, setup in, in, with your templates here. Um, if you look a bit closer on how you can use such a template engine, um, I have made a generic um, template that implements the generic structure, um, like having a header um, followed by functions, followed by the main function, and followed both by some footer, so some really generic um, function. Then there is a base template which implements this structure for loaders that are written in C language. I have a whole folder of functions that are ready implement, already implemented and ready to use within the base codes and they are modularly um, organized in their corresponding use cases. Just as a side note, you can also use template engines for resource files, um, which allows also to do flexible um, customization um, that you can apply. If we're gonna a, a bit deeper inside um, how um, the template looks like um, for um, defining the loader structure in C, um, there is above uh, many code that dynamically includes the stuff that we need from the chosen um, techniques, um, like with simple ifs um, to include um, the definitions 
also the, the functions that are implemented and so on. Furthermore, the main purpose is to create the structure for the desired output format. Um, for example, the main function in the case of an ICSI, um, the structure for a Windows service, or also the DLL events uh, or exported functions, and so on, um, even also for the special formats. If you have a look at a simple example here, um, this would be for the XLL, um, the check to include the correct function if this, this is chosen, or here below we see the different DLL events that might be included depending on what you choose. Above here, we see the main function, and every output format is executing the main function at some point, and we want to have a closer look at such a main function. The main function has the, um, has the job to get the shellcode from the location. It further um, needs to deobfuscate the shellcode, undo all the shellcode manipulation techniques which we have previously applied, and then execute the shellcode. I solve this by simply um, create templates for each of these tasks and implement it in the main function. If we look at an example, I have here a quite simple example that fits on my slides of such a main function. Um, there are various um, functions implemented above for the details, but if you see um, here just how the approach works um, with the template engines. The code engine has the jo job um, to render the template with the correct um, functionality at the correct places. And therefore, um, if we see the first step from getting the shell code, um, which was um, in this case um, placed here above, um, in the next step it implements, uh, it places the correct um, deobfuscation technique, and in the next step um, it has to apply the, the undo operations of the shellcode manipulation techniques. Um, as in this example, this can be multiple, so you need to have the right order. Um, for example, it unjigsaws the shellcode and then decrypts uh, in the case we see here. And in the last step, we need to execute the shell code. Um, in this case, this is just a very simple function pointer to ex, uh, ex, uh, execute it locally inside the loader's process. And as uh, mentioned, the main idea behind it is, the, is that the code engine um, is responsible to render the uh, template accordingly with the techniques that you have chosen previously. Um, some of the learnings I had with using template engines is that um, a debug mode is something really powerful. Um, you can also implement inside your templates some way to um, make it easier to uh, uh, build a debug payload that prints, for example, some stuff which is really interesting to learn and also debug for box. Um, Shellcode, you should not in, um, render the shellcode with your template engine. Um, this was also quite a huge learning when I um, used it. You should rather match and replace that. The main reason is that shellcode can be very big. Um, I am looking here at Sliver, for example, which has really huge shellcode that is not um, simply rendered if you, if you really want to use um, Sliver shellcode inside such a template. Um, a further learning is that it is very important to have something like an internal wrapper API, um, so to encapsulate all the different uh, API calls that you have inside the loader that they are at the single place. The reason here is that you have only one call in the framework um, to this API, and this makes it very much easier to implement future evasion features that you might want to implement. Um, for example, API hashing is then uh, can then be applied at single, single steps. Other things to note is that um, existing codes, if you have some existing code snippets, you still need to make very much adjustments that it fits into your framework and that it is also working with all of your available techniques, and this is sometimes also a bit the tricky part uh, for it. Okay, um, pretty much the same for initial access modules. Um, these are standalone submodules to create the corresponding um, stuff that you want to output. Um, 
Here, um, some of the examples, it is important to mention that for some of them, you can use the same approach with template engines. However, there are also formats like link or ISO files and where, it, um, where I chose the approach to use uh, third-party libraries uh, to generate them. Um, they can also be used then as a building block to create the full initial access chain in the next step. I don't want to waste too much time with user experience. Uh, just to mention, it's a really important topic. You have a vast amount of techniques and you really want to have it stable. So the user input, um, as always, should be validated. And I really recommend using a proper command line framework for that. Um, I found Click very useful as it also allows to create modules and submodules for custom commands. Um, other possibilities would be to directly integrate it inside Cobalt Strike, which I have done. Um, it's not a very um, enjoyable um, uh, thing to do with the aggressor language, but you can do it if you really want it. Agui. Um, containerization is very important as it allows you to further automate stuff, um, which we are going to see after. I created a Linux and also a Windows container um, for supporting both of the compiler environments. Another important step to support automation is some kind of um, YAML support or other languages. Um, it's almost for free with Click. That's really nice. It's uh, three lines of code. And what is really, really awesome about it is that it allows you to create profiles. So if you um, were able to build a loader um, for a specific product, which you have seen in an engagement, you can then um, create a profile for the corresponding product with a YAML file and have then like um, several profiles that you can use after some engagements. And also um, YAML support is really interesting to do, um, as mentioned, further automatization. Um, CICD is a popular example. And speaking of CICD, I just want to have here a small reminder that malware is software and software um, needs to have a good code quality. So um, ensure that the code quality uh, meets the standards. Um, there's nothing special in the realm of malware about it, but use um, the features that are generally also present in normal software development here. There are a few special use cases you can apply, however, in malware development. And one of them is that you can also implement Yara scanning, for example, inside the CI-CD pipeline. So there are many pop, um, public malware uh, Yara rules available. Um, for example, the Elastic EDR have them published. And you could um, generate your profile implants and inside the CI-CD then scan them with uh, all the Yara rules you want to scan them. Um, this allow is not a silver bullet, however, it allows to create some baseline and to eliminate easy indicator of compromises um, for your profiles. Um, another um, approach is that you also can integrate dynamic AV testing inside the CI-CD. I think most threat teamers and pen testers know tools like ThreatCheck or have already used them probably. Um, the approach is to let the AV scan a blob um, of the file and to detect which parts are detected by an AV. It is very time consuming if you have such a framework and if you want to test like every possible combinations out of it and therefore um, you can integrate it inside the CI CD. Um, it is very easy to implement it. I was very surprised, but um, if you use a Windows GitLab runner with a AV and EDR pre-installed, you can simply call read all bytes um, inside, even inside a Windows container, and this makes sure that the, that the bytes that are read are sent via AMSI to, to all um, AVs that are subscribed um, via AMSI. If you want to have a bit of more advanced approach, you could even um, also integrate um, tools like ThreatCheck or AVRED um, 
but um, in the case you just want to have like a fail and not fail, the simple approach with read all bytes would be enough to trigger the antivirus um, if something is detected. Um, what uh, in here important is to note that also this approach is not a silver bullet. As we have seen in the introduction slide of an EDR, the static scanner is just a really small and single part um, of the capabilities which is an EDR has, and you, of course, need to do further detection. However, um, the benefits is that it works generally with um, every AV and EDR that um, uses AMSI, and it gives you also an overview about which options are detected by a static scanner or not. And the potential is quite clear here. You could build um, also a pipeline where you have different products and then you could um, scan your profiles against the corresponding AV and EDR, for example, which is giving you a quite good baseline that no um, easy detection is inside um, there. As already mentioned before, testing is really crucial. Um, you have built a framework that has very uh, much options that you can pick and choose. The, this means also that you have an exponential growth of available combinations of all these options. Therefore, you really need to test it. You need to define useful end-to-end -end testing scenarios. Uh, my approach here to end-to-end -end test it was to have shell code that generates a proof.txt file. If the file is created, the loader um, was able to execute it, which uh, is giving a, a good indicator on uh, if there is a bug or not. If we uh, want to summarize um, what my approach was on, um, on how um, automation in malware development could look like, um, I want to say again that testing is really um, something essential and you should almost have more tests than features inside it because if you just um, apply more and more features, um, it tends to get unstable. Um, the template engines is an um, approach that I found useful to generate the loader source code. Um, and I think it's also very important to focus on, automa on automation to really automize um, the development because um, the, the code need to change a lot. Um, new techniques are coming up every day and you need to implement and adapt to them. Also, you can automate scanning, as mentioned, to defeat brittle detections. Um, this point was already mentioned. And the final point is... Um, to give here um, is try to blend in when you develop malware. If you are looking at the endpoint, there is so much telemetry going on on this endpoint um, from normal software, and it's really hard to differentiate um, what is legitimate and what is telemetry in the end. And therefore, um, this is a good principle to keep in mind when developing loaders or any kind of malware. I'm not sure how much time we have now, um, but two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> so um, perfect. We have time for fast questions if there are any. Exactly. Oh, thanks very much for the talk to start with. <laughs> And yes, while we wait for Sylvain Hirsch to make his entrance to the stage, uh, any questions for John? Come on, you all want to write malware, right? Or yeah. no, we're not supposed to now, right? Or are we? Um, I think it's important to know because I learned so much in, in the journey um, also about Windows and how it is built. So I think it's very interesting and also important to learn these uh, things. Yeah. Absolutely. Any questions? Uh, in yeah. front, shout it, we'll repeat it. How much time did you need? <laughs> so how much time did you need? To Too much. <laughs> Um, well, I, I started last year, um, nine months ago or something like that, and as mentioned, um, most of it was developed in my free time, so I spent too much time on it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Definitely. Um, it's hard to say uh, it in hours. Um, there were months where I spent like every evening on it and months where I did nothing. So, yeah. But nine months, yeah. But I'm still developing it. So you can develop uh, a lot of features uh, more on, in it. Uh. There's always more to do, right? Definitely. Any other questions? If not, then yes, absolutely well done talk. Thank you so much. And thank you very much.